remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And we're a little ways away from the 2016 presidential election, but I guess it's never too early to start looking at such things. And if this election is, is like every other election I've ever been through in my life, you, you will notice that as you get closer to election time, you'll hear people start talking about the Electoral College, which is how we determine our presidents. And undoubtedly, you'll start to hear a lot of people argue that we should move away from the Electoral College and instead use the direct popular vote as a means of electing our president. But I'm going to tell you why those people are wrong here today. I'm going to tell you why the Electoral College is your friend. That's true, it is. Now, the main argument that people have against the Electoral College is that by taking you know, the votes of every state and awarding electoral votes from each state and, and doing it that way, that it has the function of making the election come down to simply a few battleground states, maybe three or four states in an election. And so a lot of people genuinely feel that when they go to the polls, depending on what state they're in, that the vote they cast really doesn't mean much of anything for president. And it's hard to refute that argument. There's a lot of truth to that. I mean, if you live in California, let's say, it doesn't matter how you vote because you pretty well know where your electoral votes are gonna go or, or any number of other states, Texas, you could say that too. So really, most elections do come down to only three or four battleground states that have a large number of electoral votes. The idea is that campaign managers find those states that have the largest amount of electoral votes that are actually in play. So a place like California, even though it has 55 votes, it's always Democratic, so nobody really cares. But a place like Ohio that can go back and forth and has a large number of votes, well, they're going to go there. They're going to tailor their message to that state. Florida, Pennsylvania, a few others like that. So really the election comes down most of the time to three or four states. The argument against the electoral college is that, you know, in, under this system, only a small number of people are actually deciding the presidency. Only voters in a few states. And is it truly representative of the electorate of the United States? Well, they make a valid point. But what I would argue to you is that if we switched from the electoral college to the popular vote, if we did that, then the reality of an election coming down to just a small, narrowly decided group of people, that issue would not be resolved. It would only be shifted. Here's what I mean. Take a look at this little map I've got here. This is a population density map, and you'll see that population density is represented by the darker color, the darker color of red. The darker color you see on there, the more dense a population of an area it is. So you see that the, the population in the United States is certainly not evenly distributed, not even close. You see that a lot of the population is around our major cities, over in the East Coast, the West Coast, that sort of thing. Let me give you another map. that will show you the same information, but a little bit differently. This is more of a three-dimensional type of variety here. Here's a map that instead of displaying it in color, it shows it in terms of, of large peaks. The higher a peak in an area is, the more densely populated it is. And you see what look like huge mountains around New York and Boston and Washington and that kind of Bowash metropolis that people call it, that series of cities between Boston and Washington with Philadelphia included in there. You see a bunch of what look like mountains around Los Angeles and you see a couple of other big places, but beyond that, it's like the whole country's a Great Plains. So what am I getting at? What I'm getting at is this. If we go to a popular vote format for the presidency, you could take either one of those population density maps and very easily find out, very easily figure, that if you're managing a political campaign, instead of having to appeal to three or four states, now all you have to do is get a bunch of votes in three or four major cities. Think about that for a second. Instead of trying to appeal to Ohio and Pennsylvania and Florida, now you just got to go to New York City. Now you just got to go to L.A. Now you just got to go to Boston. Maybe Miami. You get those places, you're done. Mathematically speaking, the rest of the country totally wouldn't matter. 
That's even far more restrictive than the Electoral College is. Under the popular vote, you could win a presidential election simply by harvesting a significant number of votes from the East Coast, the West Coast, and a couple of other big cities. That's it. Maybe you get Chicago. Maybe you get Miami. That's all you got to do. There'd be no representation from rural America. There'd be no representation virtually at all from the Midwest or the South. You could win elections with the East Coast and West Coast, and that's basically it. Now think about the implications of that. What that would mean is that, if that's the case, if you can just harvest votes from big cities and win an election, now that means all of the strategy of a presidential election, all of the messaging of a candidate's campaign and how they tailor their campaign and uh, the policies they say they're going to implement and their message, all that's going to be tailored to the big cities. The promises that they put in their campaign, that's all going to be tailored to the big cities. Everything is going to be about the big cities. Nothing is going to be about the rest of us. Candidates would tailor campaigns solely to those people where they're trying to harvest the votes. Now, granted, they do that today in the Electoral College, but in order to win under the Electoral College, let's say you're tailoring your message to Ohio. Well, Ohio has some cities in there like Cleveland and Cincinnati, but you got a lot of rural areas. you got a lot of urban areas, affluent areas, so forth. You have to win a pretty good cross-section of people to win Ohio. You've got to win a pretty good cross-section of people to win Florida. Under the popular vote, you wouldn't have to go out there and win Florida. You'd just go win Miami and screw everything North Orlando. Oh, they wouldn't even count anymore. You would actually, and I hate the word diversity, but under the popular vote, you would severely impact the diversity of the voting base that would actually be deciding elections. It's true. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's just sour grapes. You, you just don't like the way people on the East and West Coast vote. Well... That's true to an extent, but let's think about why that is. It's not simply that they vote Democrat that I don't like. It's that I'm looking at the way most of those people live their lives, and I'm looking at the, uh, shall we say, the, the results of their decision-making over lots of years, and I'm scared to death that that type of decision-making could ever enter into presidential or national politics. I mean, look at the major cities like New York and Los Angeles and Boston and Philadelphia and Miami and Chicago. Full of crime, full of poverty. Detroit, oh God, Detroit's a great example. Full of crime, full of poverty, full of lawlessness, full of corruption. Most of those cities have been under Democratic control for decades. Some of them longer than people can even remember. And look what they've got. Look at the crumbling cities, the crime, the muggings, the carjackings, the murders, all of that. Well, if that's what letting those people will vote will end up with, if that's the result from it, why on earth would we want those people deciding presidential elections? It's obvious they can't even handle their own business. They can't even handle their own decision making as evidenced by the cities that you see where they already vote for people, where they already put people into power, and you see the results. This next part of this lesson is going to be a bitter pill for some of you to swallow. It's going to sound antithetical to everything you've ever heard in a civics class uh, growing up. But I think we need to talk about it. It's real easy, and it's real tempting sometimes, to believe that all votes are created equal. To believe that every man deserves the right to vote and that every vote is valuable every vote has equal worth sounds nice sounds good but is it really true well let's think about that think of other areas of your life is there any other area of life in which the contributions of everybody you know is equally important i should think not let's say your car breaks down on the side of the road and 10 random people come by to help you fix your car that is that has died on the on the side of the road how likely is it that all 10 of those people contributing to fixing your car would have equal value in their contributions well it's pretty unlikely let's say one of those 10 people was a car mechanic and the other nine had never worked in a car do you truly want all 10 of them working on your car or are you just going to say give me the one guy who's the car mechanic let him work on my car. You other nine jokers get lost. 
Because you intrinsically know the people who don't have a background in this, the people who don't know what they're doing, are going to do more harm than good. They're better off not contributing at all instead of trying to contribute and failing. Well, voting isn't much different than that. People who make bad decisions, people who do not know how to make decisions properly, people who cannot intelligently cast a vote, their votes really do not have value. In fact, you could say their votes have a negative value. Their votes do more harm than good. So we should not be looking for ways to increase or, or to more largely weight the participation of those people in the electoral process. We need to be finding ways to minimize their participation. Now, this argument for the Electoral College may, uh, may sicken some of you folks out there. You may, may think that I'm trying to deny the right to vote to certain people. I'm, I wouldn't go that far, but I would say that I recognize there's some people that really do more harm with their voting than good, and I think that needs to be taken into account. But believe me, if it were up to me, I would be in favor of something even far more radical than the Electoral College. If it were up to me, I would be in favor of things like raising the voting age to 30. I would be in favor of things like only allowing property owners to vote. We used to do that, by the way. Had a pretty good track record. Maybe we should go back to it. But the point of all of this is, there are people out there like me who would love to go even further than the Electoral College in terms of denying people the right to vote who really do not contribute meaningfully in a positive way. So the Electoral College is actually a pretty good compromise. It's actually something we can all live with. And yes, it's true that for a lot of people, their vote's not going to mean much of anything under the Electoral College, granted. But as I've just demonstrated, the same thing would happen under the popular vote. But at least with the Electoral College, even though only a small sample size of the total electorate is uh, deciding the election, that small sample size we have today is at least more representative of America as a whole than the small sample size that would decide elections under a popular vote. Think about that for a little bit. It may be uncomfortable for you to, to think through some of this, but give it a good thought. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. I will see you next time.